Hey, Android developers, welcome to the first ever video for Now in Android. Now in Android is a series of articles that I've been posting on Medium, trying to help people understand, including us, what we've actually done on the Android team recently in terms of releases of new libraries, new documentation, new samples and code labs, videos, anything that helps developers understand and learn Android. It's a little hard to follow it externally because this content tends to get posted in many, many places. d.android.com, YouTube, Medium, developers, blog, all over the place, right? So what we try to do with now in Android is collect that information and then put it out there with links to make it easier to find it and consume it and learn what you need to learn. But we realized as long as we're collecting the information for these articles every couple of weeks-ish, why don't we actually try to do the same thing with the video, reuse that content in case some people actually tend to get their information from video. So I'm basically going to regurgitate, not physically, but verbally, the information that's in an article every time on this video series as well. And at the same time, it turns out, this is a really technical, interesting piece of information, I think. It turns out that videos have an audio track on them. So what we're gonna do is strip out the audio track and that becomes a podcast. So ideally, every time we issue a Now in Android article, we also issue an episode of Now in Android in video form as well as podcast form. So no matter what form you take for consuming your content, as long as it's not carrier pigeon, there should be a way of getting it from us. Now, let's actually start the show. This first series on video and maybe podcast if we get around to it is for the January 8th episode of Now in Android. We're a little bit late recording this one because we're still getting everything together. So it's getting out there well after the article, but hopefully it'll get there eventually. The other ones should be a little bit more synchronized in time as we go. So in this one, we are going to start with documentation. First up, let's talk about articles. There are some new guides available on d.android.com that are worth checking out. First is room. There's a couple of things there that are worth looking at. Uh, first, I wanna point out that relationships are hard, aren't they? Wouldn't it be nice if there was documentation that helped explain how to deal with them? We can't possibly offer that, but we can offer documentation that helps you understand relationships in room. And that's exactly what Alex Cook one of the people on the tech writing team for Android has done. So he created a guide on room relationships. There was a recent article by Florina Montanescu on Medium, which you can check out, which uh, covers this information as well, has a great example of how to do this. But now that information and more is in a guide on d.android.com. So you can see the reference to how these APIs are supposed to work. Also in the room area is pre-populating the room database. This was a feature that was available in room 2.2, where you can basically initialize your database on application startup from a local file on the device. So that capability was already in the library, and now there is actually a guide that helps explain how to actually make it work. And then finally, there's a new list for KTX extensions. KTX is a set of extensions that we came out with a couple of years ago for Kotlin developers that basically make our APIs better. So we live in a reality where we cannot change the APIs of Android. Even if we look at a method and hate it, we cannot change it because any application that is using that API in its current form would break on future platforms if we change the way that it works, if we delete it from the APIs, if we change the method, the parameters that it takes, whatever, right? So we can't change it, but what we can do is introduce better methods as extensions in Kotlin, which essentially look like methods on the same class, but which are more geared towards the things that people need now. Maybe they're simpler to use, maybe they need, maybe they use new capabilities of the Kotlin language to make it easier for Kotlin developers, whatever it is. So we've introduced tons of extensions across the APIs of Android, including some in the animation area, including some for bitmaps and drawables, just all these simple use cases where a simple extension method makes many things much easier to use and reduces a lot of boilerplate. So the problem with KTX extension was, if you wanted to know what was there, you kind of needed to know what was there. It was a little weird. The documentation for it was essentially embedded in the package documentation. So you kind of needed to know that it was in the package or the class in order to go looking for it. So there was not really a way for you to say, gee, what's in KTX? And then look through a list and then figure out what you wanted to do from there. Now there is. 
There's a list of KTX extensions that Joshua Baxter has published on d.android.com. And you can check those out, see what's available, see all the APIs that have extensions associated with it, and go from there. So check it out. Next up, Android X releases. Uh, we have released a few different versions of a few different libraries this time. First up, in the stable releases, uh, you'll want to check out the biometric library. So biometric is interesting. Uh, it used to be that the biometric capabilities were in uh, APIs that were only in the platform. And then that evolved over time. So maybe we started out with fingerprint, and then we added face recognition, and then there's enhancements on that and other things to do. Wouldn't it be nice if instead there was a static library that allowed you to authenticate using whatever capabilities the platform offered? And that is what the biometric library is. It was already out there, and now there's a new version in stable that is basically a bug fix release. Browser uh, APIs, the browser static library in Android X has introduced new dark theme as well as trusted web activities capabilities. The enterprise feedback APIs just went stable with their first version, so you can check that out. Uh, and the paging library, which enables uh, gradual data loading uh, when you're working with RecyclerView, uh, that's new stable version has some minor improvements on the previous one. And then finally, the Room latest version has some minor bug fixes. Room, which we already talked about, is basically an abstraction in an API on top of SQLite. So if you're using SQLite for local persistent data storage, Room is kind of a better way to do that. It gives you type safety and build time uh, capabilities that you don't get just using raw SQLite. Uh, also, in Android X, we have a new uh, alpha library that might be worth checking out. If you like the futures capability of the Guava library, but you don't really want to take in all of Guava, because it tends to be kind of a lot, uh, then you could check out this one. It's in alpha, so maybe not ready for prime time uh, and expect it to change. But if you've been waiting for this capability uh, on its own standalone, then go ahead and check that library out. There's also a new article that Florina Montanescu has published called Observing Room Databases with Flow. So in Room 2.2 had this great feature in it where all of a sudden you could use Flow for observing changes that happen in your database, which made it a lot easier to figure out, OK, well, if stuff has changed over there, then I can react to it in my UI, uh, in my business logic, whatever. right? So that capability was there. But wouldn't it be nice if it was a little easier to understand actually how to use it besides just the pure reference docs of the library? So Florina has published this article. It's on Medium. You can check it out. Good sample code uh, and explains really how to get your hands into this new API. There's a new code lab out there called Advanced Coroutines with Kotlin Flow and Live Data. This is a uh, code lab that was written by Tim Song and Sean McQuillan for the recent Kotlin Conf conference that happened in December. There was a workshop that the team did there covering all kinds of things, including uh, the ability to use coroutines with live data and then also using it uh, with Flow. So check out that code lab. There's also a link to the raw code. So you can either do the sort of uh, code lab led version step by step for the, the full version of how this stuff works, or you can just dive right into the project and take a look at the code if you want to see what's going on. So conference videos. Um, one of the great things about conferences in the last few years is that almost every conference, certainly of a certain size on the planet, now records the sessions that are done and either live streams them or at least post those videos online soon. We certainly do that with the conferences that we sponsor here for Google I.O. and Android Dev Summit and the other Google conferences. Uh, but a lot of other conferences do this as well. It seems a little strange because don't they want the people there? Well, there's still an advantage to being at a conference if you have the time and ability to be there, if you can travel, if it's local, whatever, like the ability to actually talk with other people there. I know I enjoy that. It allows me to really soak in the content for a couple of days, where otherwise I may not take the time out of my life. It also allows me the ability to talk to people, to uh, interact with them about that, the way that our stuff works, or maybe problems that they're having, answer their questions, take feedback to the engineering team, whatever it is, right? So being at a conference locally, I think, still has advantages. But all of the technical data that you're getting from those sessions is going to be available soon, if not even live. 
Uh, and this has happened for a couple of conferences recently in Android space. It seems worth mentioning. First of all, there was DroidCon SF that happened at the end of November. Uh, lots of great technical sessions there, so you can go to their site and see those videos. And also Kotlin Conf, which I mentioned earlier, happened in early December. This is not just Android. There was a lot of Android content there. There's also a lot of, and, uh, a lot of content about the Kotlin language itself, uh, language features, multi-platform related stuff, things happening in cloud, backends, uh, server, all kinds of stuff. So if you are a Kotlin developer or you are looking to become one, um, that's a good place to go to get some content on learning how to do all that stuff. And then finally, um, I'd like to use uh, this time on this video and podcast, a link to another podcast. Uh, if you do not yet know about the ADB podcast, it's Android Developers Backstage. It's a podcast that I co-host with Roman Guy uh, and Tor Norby. We've been doing this for, I don't know, five years now. We just published episode 130. So we've got a few of those out there to listen to. A couple of episodes that came out recently were episode 129, which is Display Input and Haptics. We talked with Michael Wright, who works in the London team for Android, on all of those things. Uh, he works at a very low level and knows a lot of stuff about how display drivers work and how we receive input from sensors and then turn that into events in the system, how haptics work. Um, so interesting sort of nerdy details about all of that stuff. Um, very good stuff. And episode 130, was posted recently. It's called First Law of Motion Layout. We talked with Nicolas Roy and John Hofford on the tools team about motion layout and constraint layout. Uh, motion layout just came out with its beta release at the Android Dev Summit or soon after. Can't remember the timing details on that. Anyway, it is in beta right now. I just downloaded beta four last night, I believe. Uh, so you can play with that. The great thing about the beta release is they also released the editor for it. So you can go ahead and play with it in Android Studio. Motion layout was really cool from the beginning, but actually creating a motion layout just writing raw XML was not really for the timid. It was intended to be used in concert with a visual tool, and that's what you can now do. So go ahead and grab the latest bits and listen to the podcast for more about motion layout as well as about constraint layout. And finally, I'd like to say thanks for watching or listening if you're hearing this on a podcast and watch for future episodes of this in video form, in article form, and in podcast form. And finally, obviously it's hard to kind of link to these things as I'm talking along. So if you want the, the URLs, if you want the links to the stuff that I've been talking about, please do check out the article on Medium because all of the links are embedded in the article. It's the same content there, but links make it a little bit easier to get to those sites. Thanks, talk to you next time.